I had to I had to stay up and watch the end of the hockey game. Yeah, <laughs> just it, it was it was tough. I did take a melatonin because I thought I might also get a, a deeper sleep because this is not working for me. You know, and uh, rest is good. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Ken. This is my wife Brenda. Uh, we have uh, been uh, uh, given the privilege and honor to serve our network of churches uh, all across BC and the Yukon. Uh, over the last 17 years, that's what we have been giving our lives to. And it's been an honor and a privilege to do that. Uh, we travel most weekends. Uh, Brenda's with me. I'm usually on the road about 40 weekends a year. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the truth. Uh, Brenda's usually with me about 30 of those 40 weekends. And uh, this weekend, it's an honor to be with you today as you're the pastor of the pastors. So our network is about 209 churches all across BC and the Yukon. So you can imagine what kind of territory that is. It's about 600,000 square miles of, of territory. Farthest northern church is Dawson City. Uh, farthest west is Port Alberni. Farthest south is Osoyas. And the farthest east is Elkford. And so that's where my travels take me all the, all the way through. So thank you for being a church that supports a vision and a mission to reach lost people. Isn't that what it's about? It's about people who don't know Jesus. And so this morning, I've, I come to you with uh, a, co uh, a compliment and an appreciation. Thank you for supporting this church and its shared mission with us as the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. Uh, we have uh, a mission to accomplish throughout 1,200 churches across Canada and globally. We're a global organization. And so thank you for supporting that. And over the past few years, this church has been so instrumental in cultivating relationships with um, lost people, with people who don't know Jesus, bringing them to faith and discipling them well, whether it's through the ESL program or through Alpha or through other things that, have, that this church has done, especially the connection that you've had with the school over the years. That has been outstanding. Uh, many have come to faith through that. This morning, however, I, I'm here for a special reason as well. I'm here uh, to deliver some sad news to you. Pastor Kevin Fricker and I met for lunch uh, about a few days ago. And uh, he just opened up his heart to me and said, Ken, I believe I've completed my task. I've completed my assignment at Delta Pentecostal Church. So uh, we, during that lunch, he advised me of a personal journey in prayer and discernment regarding his tenure as lead pastor here. And he said, after spending some time uh, seeking spiritual insight, talking to some trusted friends and advisors, that uh, he and Shannon had made a difficult decision uh, to conclude their assignment here, to, uh, uh, believe, to believe that God is bringing them to something else and to turn the reins of leadership over to someone else here. So please understand, this is a difficult decision for them. It wasn't easy because they genuinely loved this church. I want you to know that it was it was emotional for Pastor Kevin uh, while we were having lunch together to say that he's he feels that he's completed. He's finished here. Um, Kevin and Shannon expressed a sincere appreciation for the love that you have all shared with them. Honestly, over and over again, they said they love the congregation. Uh, they also expressed a very sincere uh, appreciation for your support during recent loss and grief in their own personal family. They've lost loved ones and you have come around them and supported them in your prayers and love. Um, and they also wanted to uh, say that they genuinely appreciated the open-hearted welcome that you gave them when they came first from Alberta. It was just an amazing, the church surrounded them and, and loved them when they arrived. So while Pastor Kevin anticipated a longer tenure as your pastor, he and Shannon realized that this precious congregation uh, requires a lead pastor with some very distinct and unique leadership gifts. And he felt that he was not best suited for the pastoral role and responsibilities at the church. So if you chisel it all down, that's, that's what he felt, that, that there was someone that would fit better here and that he would fit better somewhere else. Um, he didn't tell me he was going anywhere else, so he's taking some time to pray and to consider. So he's not moving from here to another ministry assignment. He's, he's taking time to pray and consider that. Uh, let me encourage you with these biblical thoughts. Jesus is in control of his church, <laughs> right? Right? Do you agree then? I thought, it, maybe you're just tired, <laughs> but like, Jesus is in charge of his church, right? Okay, 
That's that's what I'm thinking. You're actually Pentecostal out there. <laughs> I have got I like I said, I've been in this role 17 years. Things don't surprise me anymore. You know why? Because I have I'm fully abandoned to, to the Lordship of Jesus. Like he knows what he's doing. He know even when we don't know what we're doing, <laughs> he knows what he's doing. Okay. And when circumstances fall short of our human expectations. Doesn't it happen to you all the time? Someone lets you down. Someone disappoints you. Someone uh, does something and you go, hmm, why did that happen? That's when you have to press into Jesus. Even when things uh, exceed our mortal understanding and we're left confused and feeling a little displaced and vulnerable, let me assure you this one thing that I am so confident in. I would stake my life on it, okay, that Jesus knows what he's doing. His plans are higher than our plans. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And though we look at the earthly realities and we think about the earthly understandings that we have, our mortal brain can only figure out the, the linear stuff that we deal with. God is supernatural. He exceeds time. And he knows what the future holds for us. So as he moves the Frickers on to their new calling, I am confident of this that he will provide an under-shepherd for this church. And as, as I stand before you today, I want you to know that I am 160%. I don't know why 60, but that's the first one that came to my mind. All right. <laughs> I'm more than 100% sure that Jesus is going to prevail here. You know, And, and I commit to you uh, as your district servant that I will walk alongside this church as I've done in the past. You have my 100% commitment. And some people say, Ken, you're so busy. Yeah, sure, I'm busy. We're all busy, right? But we make time for things that are important. And I promise you that I will work with the board. Um, I've already met with the board members last week, and uh, we are starting to take some steps forward in the transition process. So let me tell you about those steps. First of all, uh, during this transition process, we are going to meet as a board, as a leadership team, as perhaps core leaders, to talk about church, vision, mission, direction, governance, communication, all those things. We're going to work on those things together. You have my word on that. Now, I have to apologize to this congregation because I had given that promise many months ago and somehow things got away on us and there's no excuses. I'm not a person of excuses. I own it. I should have been on it, but this time around, we're going to be on it, okay? And we're going to get things done. Um, we're going to talk about governing board roles and responsibilities and better understand the role of the pastors and those kinds of things. So that's my commitment to you. The second thing I'd like to let you know about is that we have, as a board, reappointed Pastor Greg and Monique Jans to come back. We reeled them back in, okay? <laughs> now, they're, they're still here. They've been helping with Alpha and, and very committed. So I, from the board meeting uh, night, I called them on my way home. I said, Greg, it's Ken. And he goes, what? <laughs> and he was in, he's in Phoenix right now. That's where my daughter lives, actually. And so, uh, and they're both realtors. So they're, I don't know if they're connected or not, but uh, he was out golfing. So I thought, no, he wasn't golfing at night when I left the board meeting. The next day he was golfing. And I said, hey, Greg, I need you to come and help us with a transition. And he and Monique have said yes. So just rest assured, we're going to have continuity. I'm speaking today. Pastor Greg will be speaking next Sunday. And onward from there, we will make sure that there is consistency in ministry. I've also given the pledge that some of our team at the district office can come and offset Sundays when when Pastor Greg is not available or doing other things. So we have done that. This is my last thing before we move into today's, method, uh, today's message. Can I ask you for, for one thing? One thing. That's prayer. Okay? Nothing good happens in the kingdom of God without good communication with God. Prayer and fasting. I know some of you may not have ever fasted before. I'm not, as you can tell, not a good faster. <laughs> but fasting doesn't always have to be food, right? We always think about fasting as food. Fasting is actually uh, eliminating a dependency in our life, like the internet, coffee, the Vancouver Canucks. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> you know, we, we set aside the time that we would have spent doing that in pressing in with God. And so if you can fast, it doesn't have to be food. 
because some of you may have medical conditions that don't allow you to do that. That's fine. But fast and pray. Seek God. And I promise you, he will move. He'll move in a very powerful way. Because I believe that this church has a very distinct purpose. My goodness, I drove through your neighborhood today. And I'm just, my soul just cries out for the people in this neighborhood. They're, this church, let's fill this place right up. You know, with seekers and people who are followers and devoted disciples of Christ. So would you pray? Would you fast? And uh, I promise you, this won't be the last time you see me. <laughs> we'll be together in another occasion. But we will be working with the board. Pray for your board as well. The leaders of this church are amazing. Okay? We should give them a hand. Just give them a hand. Yeah. They really are. Yeah. And they are pressing in. They are trusting God. And I was, I'm just so impressed by the leadership of this church. So... Let me start with prayer. Jesus, we put into your hands this, uh, this resignation that we've received. We now, Father, accept that you are in control of your church. You are the bridegroom. We are the bride. You love us so much. One day you're coming back for us. You're going to come back in the clouds. You're going to receive us to be with you. And we will live with you forever and ever and ever, eternally. That's the eternal life that you purchased on the cross. The song Amber sang, many songs indicated your resurrec resurrection and life that you gave us. And so we have faith and trust that this is our purpose on earth, to bring the message, the good news to those who don't know you, so that they too can have eternal life. So we ask this, Father, in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. 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 If you brought your Bibles to church today, let me direct your attention to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, now, we read Bibles all kinds of different ways, and it's okay if you have a hard copy of the Word or if you have a digital copy of the Word. As you know, I travel a lot, and so my Bible sits in my iPad here, and uh, so it's, it's easy, and uh, I'm able to, to um, read and study. By the way, if you want to know a great hack for Bible study, um, download an app or the program called Bible Hub. You can Google it, Bible Hub. It is probably the best thing I've ever found on the net about uh, uh, Bible study. It's got all kinds of tools, Greek, interlinear. It's got commentaries. It's got all kinds of stuff. So if you're a student of the scriptures, you want to download Bible Hub and figure uh, you can follow along. It's got other, other kind of outlines and different things like that. This morning... I want to talk about this, anxiety. How many of you have ever been stressed out? Okay, <laughs> come on. There's a support group for you who didn't raise your hands. <laughs> because, because I think everybody in this room has been stressed at some point in their life. Okay, we all go through it. Worry. My wife says, Ken, like repeatedly, Ken, you worry too much. Okay, it'll be fine. That's my daughter, Sydney, who's a massage therapist in Fort Langley. She goes, Dad, you're going to give yourself a heart attack. It'll be fine. And then, you know, how many of you have ever stayed up at night looking at your ceiling, just churning, let the tapes churn through your head about something you're working through, whether it's in your work or your neighborhood or, you know, a relational issue or a family issue? We all go through it. We all have these moments of anxiety that just tax us emotionally, physically, because you can't sleep, and spiritually, because you wonder, where is God in all of this? I'm serving Jesus. Like, doesn't he know what I'm going through? Has he just turned his back on me? And you wonder sometimes, where, where is God in all of this? Anxiety, you have to control it before it starts controlling you. You know, that's, it's something that I've, I've spent all my life. I'm turning 60 this year, and I don't think I've ever mastered the fact that you have to control anxiety before it starts controlling you. Because it creeps in quickly. And it has the ability to seize your soul. And then all your thoughts and all your, your um, uh, uh, dreams and visions, all of those get captivated by anxiety. And anxiety pays emotional tax. Uh, sorry, anxiety pays emotional interest on crises before the payment is due. The things I worry about sometimes never happen. And yeah, Brenda's going, yeah, I told you so. <laughs> like, I shouldn't have her here today. Because like, <laughs> guess what's going to happen on the way home? 
She's going to say, see, you preached about what I've been telling you all along, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, she is, she is pretty right at times. Only at times, Brenda. Okay. <laughs> uh, worry does not, this, is, comes, this comes from Corey Ten Boom. Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. Can you imagine that? Like it doesn't, it doesn't help us in the future. It doesn't help us to actually feel more happy and more at peace. It creates churning in our soul and it takes control of us. So and it, it doesn't go away just because someone tells you, don't worry. Have you ever said, have you noticed? Just don't worry about that. What do you mean don't worry? That's not an antidote to worry. Okay, you got to give me more than that. Telling, telling me not to do something doesn't help me not do it. I need reasons. So this is why I'm a very practical preacher, teacher. I'm going to give you some practical tools today that you can, and by the way, Blessing and, and um, others in the, in the tech booth there, Gabe and others, will have this online. So you can take my notes if you want. Okay, so you don't have to worry about getting every piece. So, yeah, you don't have to worry about the worry sermon. You get it all, okay? <laughs> All right. You know, I, I, got, I read this in online uh, just recently, and they, uh, a uh, client went into the, a psychologist's office and was um, struggling with anxiety. So the psychologist posed a question to him. He said, how would you diagnose a person who's yelling and screaming one moment and then crying at the very next moment? And the client fell uh, uh, silent. So the psychologist said, well, I would define him as... Vancouver Canucks fan <laughs> yelling and screaming one minute crying the next yes we have those kind of moments but anxiety is something that we we don't deal well with because it it can sneak into our lives so quickly and so suddenly and unfortunately it makes us uh, um, kind of spiral into a prison it, it's uh, we get prison behind imprisoned behind the the thoughts and fears and all of those things. And you know, the, and culture and news doesn't help us much. Have you turned on your news lately? Turn it off. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Like my daughter actually has stopped watching news because it is so either depressing or stressful. But when you turn it on, you hear about all the tensions in our world. You hear about the Ukraine and Russia tensions, the Gaza, Israel. And like you think, is this, is this the end of all times? Like, and so those, there's some stresses that come in from just world events, global terrorism, economic collapse. You know, we've gone through some turbulent times. If you have investments, you watch your investments go like this every time you turn on, uh, you know, you look at your investment portfolio. Political scandal. Like, my goodness, there's, there's so much tension south of our border. I'm not even going to go there, you know, and I'm not physically. I go there and we're going for Easter with our kids in Arizona, but not going there politically. Because you can't say anything, whether you're conservative or liberal. I mean, you just say anything and it's the wrong thing. There's so much tension. Uh, car accidents, earthquakes, tsunamis, you, medical problems, financial strain. It's all there. So all of these stresses and anxieties are pushing in on us every day. So let's look at the scriptures. Let's take a moment and say, when the, wor the world is pressing in on us, and when anxiety is pushing in on our soul, what do you do? Well, Jesus says this. That is why, okay, uh, and let me just say this quickly. Whenever you see a that is why or therefore in Scripture, you always have to look at what's, what happened right before it. And if you look at Matthew chapter 6, it's a, an incredible teaching, a Sermon on the Mount stuff. And right before this passage, Jesus is talking about materialism and money and the fact that you cannot serve two gods. Okay, you only can serve one God. And if your mind is dominated by materialism and wealth, that's where your attention and your worship will go. So this is why it goes. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear or enough purses. That was just, just for my wife there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. It's going to be a rough ride home. I'll tell you that. <laughs> She's, she loves me, I'm sure. Um, 
Uh, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in uh, barns, uh, for your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't they far more valuable to him uh, than, sorry, are, aren't you more uh, far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? I kind of highlighted that on the text there. I did, it didn't show up here, but I highlighted it in my text. Can, can worry actually do anything to extend life? Not a chance. In fact, it robs you of your days, right? It robs you of your life. And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Now, Jesus flips the script here and he says, why do you have such little faith? Did you notice this little flip of the script? First, he's talking about anxiety and worry and fear. And then he links it to faith. He goes, faith, why do you have so little faith? This is not life-saving faith. This is actually trust in God. If you take the root word, if you go to your Bible app and you look at what the actual Greek word here is, it talks about trust, not life-giving, saving faith. He says, why don't you trust the Lord? Hmm. Let me, I'll get back to that. Um, so don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. People often ignore that and live righteously part. So they think, seek the kingdom of God and do whatever you want, and you get anything you want. That's the kind of lottery mentality we have in our world. It's not true. You have to live righteously. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble has enough. Now, the mic drop moment there is this. If you believe that Jesus has his hands on your future, this will be your antidote to worry. It's actually not an issue of worry as much as it's an issue of control. <laughs> How many of you are control freaks like me? Okay, I admit it, my hands up. I need to control things. And when I feel out of control, that's when I start worrying the most. When I feel like the circumstances around me are falling apart and I can't do anything about it, that's when this anxiety rises up and I try to take control of everything around me. And it's, it's wrong. I need to release control. Faith, this is, the, this is the, the phrase that I came up with. Faith in God and fear actually come from the same things. Let me explain this to you. Faith in God is the assurance of a blessed future. Fear is the expectation of a cursed future. Let me, let me run that by you again. Faith and fear are similar. Fear says, I'm worried about the unknown. Faith says, I don't know what God is going to do about the future, but I trust him. I trust him. So faith and fear come from the same root. They have one thing in common. They both believe in a future that has not yet happened. The only problem is fear takes you in the direction of anxiety and faith takes you in the direction of trust. Okay? Faith and fear. I think that's why God connected those or Jesus connected those in his sermon. He said, faith and fear are the same thing. Um, and earthly anxiety takes us to a place where we worry about things like money and clothing and food. Existential anxiety takes us to a place where we worry about life. We worry about our future. We worry about our kids. We worry about our grandkids. We worry about the things that are unknown to us. And we're profoundly concerned about the future. What's going to happen next? I bet you when I uh, gave the announcement of Pastor Fricker's uh, resignation, all of you probably thought, what's going to happen next? You know, what is the future going to hold? Like, it seems to make you feel a little vulnerable when we don't know the future. And that's when fear creeps in. Suddenly we're starting to deal with a whole load of anxiety. And fear has a way of immobilizing us. Let me tell you a quick story. I was flying from Prince Rupert to Masset, to our church in, on, the, on Haida Gwaii. 
Actually, we have two churches on Haida Gwaii. And so I got into to Prince Rupert, and the only plane available was a float plane. Has anybody ever flown on a float plane? Okay, you guys know what I'm talking about. Very small. Okay, there's the pilot, the passenger seat, and one in the back. The, I got the one beside the pilot. Okay, and the guy in the back must have been Catholic because he kept going like this. All right? <laughs> and he was super nervous, like super nervous. So we got all our luggage in, and we, you know, brr, 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 we start taking off out of, out of uh, Prince Rupert, and uh, we're flying. And it is absolutely a stunning, gorgeous day. Beautiful blue sky, sun is shining. We're flying about 500 feet above the water. It is actually spectacular. And we're not a few miles offshore, and a storm in the North Pacific rolls in. And I'm not kidding you, it rolled in fast. We're flying along, and I see this big black thing coming across the Pacific, and I'm going, I said to the pilot, hey, uh, you know, I, I don't need to be in mass at that, that. I've got wife and kids at home. Like, you know, we can turn back. And he goes, no, no, I, th I think we'll make it. You think? <laughs> like, we're, what, what are you talking about? You think we'll make it. It should be okay. So then we're flying along, and, and it just socks in. And there is rain and thunder and lightning. The first thunder, you know, clap of thunder made me, just, it sent the guy behind me into like, a, <laughs> like, I've never seen him so nervous and worried in my whole life. Anyways, so the, the pilot says, no, we're going to press on. We're going to get there. And so we're flying through this storm and I'm feeling like a butterfly. Like I'm telling you, the wingspan just fluttering through the, the air. And so finally we get to Masset and we land in a storm and we came down on one pontoon, like we hit the, the water on one, and I'm looking out the window, and I saw the wind, wingtip skim the water. And so as we finally landed, and we're coming into the dock, the pilot goes, phew. <laughs> I'm going, what? <laughs> like, are you kidding me? And he goes, yeah. He says, uh, if that wing had caught the water, we'd all been gone telling me that you know so we get we get to home or we get to the dock and i phone brenda brenda you will not believe and we have this little saying whenever i'm in some dangerous kind of travel area i she, i go don't boil the eggs yet you know what that means because i said if i ever go you know and I, I and you're doing my funeral i want egg salad sandwiches at my funeral so i said brenda don't boil the eggs i'm okay you know i made it all right uh but that whole experience actually taught me a few things about anxiety. It really did. It really did. God is in control. I don't get to live on this planet one moment beyond what he decides. You don't, you don't have control over that. You can walk out these doors today and that could be the end of your life. Okay? You could breathe your last prayer before sleeping tonight and that will be it. You don't get to decide that. That's where we have to trust God. We have to trust him. And when you have given your life to him, you've made him Lord of your life, you're actually saying, you're the Lord and I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually following you. I'm not trying to control you, Jesus. You're in control. I'm not. That's what you're saying. So let's talk about what anxiety does because I only have a few more minutes. But I do want to give you some, some facts about anxiety. Here's four things that anxiety does to you and four ways to control anxiety in your, in your life. Okay, first thing. Here we go. Anxiety strangles God's word. It strangles it. We have to learn how to manage our paranoia versus God's promises. That's the difference right there. Paranoia. God's promises. It's a tension you have to manage. And the Bible says this, and, and it was Jesus referring in Mark chapter 4 to a farmer who goes out and scatters seed. Do you remember that parable? He goes out and scatters seed, and some falls among the thorns, some falls among the rocky soil, some uh, uh, on shallow ground, the birds eat it up, and some falls on good soil, thick, rich, in rich soil. Okay? Let's take a little snippet out of that. Still others, like seed sown among thorn, hear the word, but the, here's that word, worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth 
And the desires for other things come in and choke out the word, making it unfruitful. This teaching is profound for me because I realize that in my own life, I need to say this, Ken, are you trusting in the word and the promises of God? Or are you giving yourself to the paranoia of your deceitfulness of wealth and the worries of life and the cares and concerns? Now, let me say this. Care and concern has a positive side. I have care and concern over 209 churches. I worry about our churches. I worry about the future of our mission. Some of those things are healthy. They actually promote good things in our lives. They, they motivate us to do good things. But when they captivate and control us, that's when it gets dangerous. That's when it gets dangerous. So the word gets strangled. Why? Because the worries of life creep in. Think about the temptation of Jesus, right? The, 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 um, the devil is tempting Christ. And he says to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself from the highest place in the temple. Surely the angels will save you. If you bow down and worship me, I will give you all the kingdom of God. Those are all false promises. They're, they're lies. And if Jesus was paranoid... He might have believed those things. But he says, no, that's not the word of God. That's not what, this, what my father said. I know my purpose. I know why I'm here. I know what I'm doing. And he rebuked all those things. So first thing we have to realize is that worry strangles God's word. It chokes out God's word. So we have to defeat it. Second thing, it steals our contentment. Chokes and it steals contentment. We live in a world that everything is faster and better. You know, have you, have, if you're in the iPhone craze, <laughs> every four years, someone, you know, Apple will come out with a new iPhone that's faster, smaller, sleeker, you know. And so you just have to have the bigger, the better. Why do you think they do that? They want to make you discontent with what you have. <laughs> it's a marketing thing. Okay. And I believe that worry does the same thing in our lives. It takes away contentment from our lives. Now, where do I get that from? First Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. And this is what it says. Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing in, nothing with us when we came into this world, and we can take, we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and hum harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows, many anxieties. Same root word. Let me say this to you. If you have money, good for you. If you love money, not so good for you. If you're rich in this world, God bless you. Be a river. Don't be a reservoir. Be a river of blessing. Let the money flow and bless and, and do good things. Okay? All of us here probably have more, than, more wealth than 90% of the world. Okay? There's nothing wrong with money. This is not about you know, wealth or, or a condemnation of wealth. This scripture is actually talking about love, the love of money. Becoming the root of all evil. If you manage your money well, and you use it as a source of, of kingdom expansion and blessing and, and sustenance, great, good for you. But if it dominates your thoughts, so remember I said paranoia and promises? The second tension we have to manage is our cravings versus our contentment. Because this world is full of craving. This world is always about getting something better. When it rains, we grumble. When it shines, we grumble it's too hot. When it's election time, we grumble about the leaders that are running. When it's rush hour, we grumble about congestion. Uh, we have a grumbling kind of culture, don't we? We are never satisfied. True? And if anybody, I mean, you can disagree with me if you want. Throw tomatoes. <laughs> but we have a culture that is never happy. Never satisfied, never content, because we always want more, 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 more. But this scripture is saying to battle worry and anxiety, start being more content. Start being more content. So 
It strangles, it steals, it shrinks and stretches our reality. Worry shrink, shrinks and stretches our reality. Do you remember the, the song we used to sing in Sunday school? Twelve men went to spy on Canaan. Thank you, Sister Brenda, who grew up in Sunday school. <laughs> You know, I came to faith when I was 17. She was born and raised in a church pew in Powell River. Okay, her teeth marks are probably still in the pew and that, you know. But uh, we used to sing a song about the spies that went into the land of Canaan that were sent there to, to bring back reports, right? This scripture is found there as an illustration of how worry shrinks and stretches reality. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites, the land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All, look at that word, all. When we are, when we are uh, talking about worry, we tend to talk in extremes. Never, always, right? We always say this and never do that. Um, all the people we saw there were huge. We even saw giants there and descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too. Tell you what worry does. It starts shrinking and stretching reality. It starts making your resources seem so small. You'll never have enough. You'll never be good enough. It magnifies the monsters and minimizes our resources. That's what worry does. It says, I'll never have enough. I'll never make it. I'll never be good enough. I'll never get that job promotion. Anxiety always shrinks and stretches the reality. So what? It, it strangles, it steals, it shrinks and stretches, and it slows us down. This is what worry does. Have you ever felt like you're towing a double-decker bus with all the baggage you're carrying and all of the worries and anxieties? It's like going, ah, oh, I'm trying my hardest to get through life and trying to get through my job and trying to work with my family, and I just can't seem to get anywhere. feels like I've got a bus on my neck. This is what it says. Worry weighs a person down. An encouraging word cheers a person up. Proverbs 12. Then Jesus said in Matthew 11, look at these words. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, buses, double-deckers, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy to bear and my burden, the burden I give you is light. You know what happens when worry comes in? You feel like you're attached to this bus and you're pulling and you're pulling. And Jesus is saying, guess what? Take my yoke. See that strap that this guy's uh, hauling with? Picture Jesus yoked with him. Suddenly, all-powerful God is pulling your bus, and you feel rest. You feel relief. You feel like, this is not my bus to pull. This is God's bus. The worries are God's worries, and it actually is a spiritual, uh, a, a spiritual exercise to say, Jesus, this is yours. I give this to you. This chaotic mess in my workplace or this chaotic mess with my daughter or my son, it's yours. I give it to you. Pull it, Jesus. And you immediately feel the compounding effect of Christ pulling with you. Heavy burdens become simpler. They don't go away. Let's, let's, just, let's just be real here, okay? There's no silver bullet here. Suddenly, you know, you think, well, Ken said this, so if I just have, have a quick prayer, all my worries will go away. No, they don't go away. They get lighter. They get easier to manage because the supernatural power of God is pulling your bus. Okay, that's the difference. The more you have, the more things you begin to worry about. So you sometimes need to attach Christ. Not sometimes, always need to attach Christ to this heavy burden. Okay. I've only got a few more minutes left, and I want to give you Russell's remedy for worry, okay? This is partly scripture, and it's partly Russell, okay? So if you're taking notes, great. You don't have to, but it's all scripture, okay? So let's go to the last four slides. Here it is. My action plan for anxiety comes out of Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4, 4. 
Okay, and it's this. It's very simple. It's easy. Number one, and they all start with R, so you'll remember Russell and R, okay? So you can connect it in your Bibles. Rejoice, the Bible says. Rejoice. Fill your mind with joyful thoughts. Philippians 4, 4, always be uh, uh, full of joy in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. Step number one for Ken is this. Find something to rejoice about. Like when your mind is playing those tapes and you're up at night worrying about whatever it is that's causing you stress, find one thing to rejoice about. Lord, thank you for doing X, Y, Z in my life. I can rejoice. Or go back to a place where joy was your portion. Go back. Take your mind back to that place. Rejoice is an action word. It's an active uh, verb. And it's often used in the Bible as a greet, greeting or salutation. That's how they used to, to greet people. Did you know that? When they put out their hand, they go, rejoice. Rejoice. Re rejoice again, I say. You know, that's how they used to greet people. We don't do that much anymore, do we? We go, hey, have you heard about what Trudeau's doing? Hey, have you heard? You know, like, that's, that's how we, we go through life. We, go, we get political. We get anxious. We get a climate change. We get, you know, all the stuff that's going on in our world. That's what we talk about. Friends of ours just came back from a Caribbean cruise, and they were, they, they were down, um, uh, you know, in the... In, uh, I can't remember where they took off from Florida or somewhere. And they said they couldn't believe how political the dinner conversation got to the point where they had to say, hey, can we not talk about politics? Is there anything else we can talk about? Because it's so depressing, you know? So rejoice. Find something in your life that brings joy. Okay? Uh, and then talk and dwell on that. Start rejoicing about that. Start uh, talking about that. And you're not ignoring the stress. You're not ignoring the worry. What you're doing is providing an antidote. For every stressful situation, you find something you can rejoice in and balance it out so that your mind doesn't become dominated by stress and anxiety. Number two, remember life is temporary and Jesus is coming. First rejoice, second remember. So here's the scripture again. Always be full of joy in the Lord. Say, I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do and remember the Lord is coming soon. So here's what Ken does when I'm full of anxiety. I find something that I can rejoice in and then I remind myself, Ken, you're only here for a little longer. <laughs> Come Lord Jesus. One day... I'm getting a brand new body. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> I've already pre-ordered mine. Did you know that? I got on Amazon.god and I put my order in for a body that looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Tom Cruise. It's a combination. So I'm going to run like Cruise and I'm going to be like built like Schwarzenegger. Now he's old, so maybe it's all sagging. But anyways... <laughs> right? I, we're not going to have these bodies anymore. We're not going to have these troubles anymore. One day in a twinkling of the eye, Christ is coming back. Let's not forget that. So Russell, when you're all anxious and wound up about stuff on this earth, first, find something to rejoice in. Second, remember you're only here for a little while. You're, you're going. You're going. I'm not going to be here forever. You know, like I have, I have some friends who are so strung out about climate change. And I don't, I'm not a climate change denier. Yeah, we're, it's changing. But it's also predicted and prophesied in the scriptures. Yeah, you know, it, it is going to end. The, the planet is going to conclude. We're going to go if you've made Jesus Lord of your life. So rejoice. Remember that there are eternal realities that we're looking forward to. A new body, no suffering, no pain, unbroken relationships with God and others. People that you are frustrated with today, you won't be frustrated with in eternal life. Okay? Hopefully you don't get a mansion beside the person who ticks you off here. Okay? <laughs> but you're not here the whole time. My mother is 96 years old. Did you know that? Yeah, she lives at Elam Village. Okay? And she's got dementia. She's in a wheelchair. But I think my goodness, one breath. She's one breath away, right? And then she, I'm one breath away from the inheritance, but she's one. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm joking with you, okay? <laughs> now you guys know what I really think. <laughs> no. 
She's one, can you imagine she takes one last breath here on earth? She's completely healed. No wheelchair, no dementia. She is completely transformed. I got to remind myself. Rejoice. Remember. Number three, recite. Going back to Philippians 4. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say again, rejoice. Let everything, uh, let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon. Here's the next one. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Recite. Prayer. Like, tell people, like, this is something we overlook here. My action plan for anxiety is, hey, Ken, you're so stressed out. Did you actually take time to recite and pray through everything that you're worried about? And I'd probably have to say, no, sorry, that's on me. That's on me. Like, I, I spend so much time worrying, so little time praying. Pray about everything. Talk to God about everything, even the trivial things. I spend enormous hours on the road driving from assignment to assignment. I'm going to Prince George tomorrow, 10 hours, right? And sometimes I'm driving along and I just, I just pray out loud. People are passing me going, what is that idiot doing? Like, <laughs> he's talking out loud in the car, but it's just me and God. You know, sometimes I pray in tongues because there's nobody else in the, in the car. Who cares? You know, and so pray about everything. You won't shock God with your fear, your anxiety, or your complaining. <laughs> Have you ever complained to God? Come on. Huh? No one? You guys are all saints? My goodness! <laughs> yeah, we all complain. It's okay to complain to God. God, this doesn't seem fair. You know, this doesn't seem right. This seems unjust. Don't bottle it up. Pray about it. Last one. Sorry, two more. Recall. Okay? Pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Then it says, and thank him for all he's done. Do you remember the hymn? Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. <laughs> you know, we don't, we count, then we name. We say, God, remember the time when you, when I had no money, I was a youth pastor in Duncan and my car broke down. This is a true story, by the way. <laughs> And Brenda and I were, were living on $800 a month and, uh, because that's all the church could pay us. And our car broke down and my car was on a hoist and I had no way to pay for the transmission that had just blown out of it. And so I was walking from my house to the mechanic shop, kicking rocks and going, God, I can't believe this. Gave up a good paying job for going into the ministry and making $800 a month. And now my car breaks out and I'm complaining to God. My action plan was to take out my credit card and pay for the transmission and then figure out how I was going to pay for it. I get to the mechanic and I pull out my credit card and this, I'm not exaggerating. The guy goes, oh, sir, um, you don't, it's been taken care of. Now, my car was an AMC Pacer with good, you know, wood grain paneling. So it was quite noticeable. <laughs> You know, in Duncan, not a lot of people, you know, wrote, drove those cars. And he, so this is what the mechanic said. He goes, someone from your church recognized your car on the hoist and paid your bill. Could he not have bought me a new car? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. You know? <laughs> I drove out of, my, out of that mechanic with my AMC Pacer, thanking God. Thank you, God. Even I was complaining on the way there, God. I'm so sorry. But you took care of me. You took care of me. Tell him what you need. And then thank him for what he has done. Last one. Remain. Remain. Okay, it's so important. Rejoice, remember, recite, recall, remain. Look at the last words of that, that scripture. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. If you do this, the scripture says, then you will experience God's peace which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will guard your heart and your mind as you live in Christ Jesus. Remain. Remain in the presence of God. This is a worship service, and we're going about to conclude this in a minute. But when you walk out those doors, you can remain in the presence of God. In fact, Monday through Saturday is more important than Sunday morning. It really is. 
What you do in the morning, what you do every morning, re- remaining in the presence of God, finding a moment in your life, whether it's commuting to work or a quiet moment in the morning or in the evening, find some time to f- remain in the presence of God. You don't have to get away on the mountaintop. You don't have to go away on a retreat. What it means to remain is to eliminate all the distractions. Turn the phone off. I'm one to talk. Brenda, Brenda holds me accountable to this, okay? Because my phone buzzes, and when my phone doesn't buzz, my watch does it. You know, it's, we live in such a distractive world. Everybody's demanding our attention. This scripture says, turn it all off and remain in the presence of God. Because if you do this, the peace of God will come in and transcend your understanding. Friends, would you stand with me? Amber, your team, if you would come back. And I don't know if you have a closing song. No, you don't? Do you normally have? You have some announcements. See, I'm not normal here. (laughs) I'm not normal anywhere, but I mean, so I, I will flow with you. I will turn the service over to you in a moment, okay? Let me say this in this precious moment today. I don't want to manipulate you emotionally. I don't want to engineer the moment here. But I, and I am new here, and I, this sermon here was not prepared for any one person because I don't know your story. But I would ask you for consideration for one moment. Would you just close your eyes for a moment? Because it can sometimes be hard for people to receive God's, God's power and prayer if they feel people are looking at them. So with eyes closed, no one looking around, I just would like you to indicate to me If you need God's transformative power today for something that is stressing you out. Yeah, I see your hands. My dear, dear sisters, brothers, thank you. Anyone, thank you, over on this section. Balcony, anyone there? All right, I see your hand too, my friend, my dear brother. So there's a lot of us here. So let me say this to you. Whatever it is, that is captivating your your thoughts right now. That issue, that problem, that relationship, whether it be financial or health or anything, do you, are you willing to put that into the hands of God? At this very moment saying, Jesus, I don't have an answer for this. I don't have a solution for this. It's like the bus on my neck. I'm giving this over to you. I'm, I'm relinquishing the right to control my circumstances right now. And I'm trusting that you will resolve this issue by your supernatural power. If you, do, if you say yes to that, I'm going to pray over, to you, pray over you right now. Jesus, those who raise their hands today in this church have come to this worship service carrying a load, carrying a burden, And we understand what that does to people. We understand, Lord, that it can strangle the Word of God, the promises of God. It can steal away our contentment. It can stretch and shrink the realities around us. It can make us feel so minimal, like grasshoppers facing giants. It can make our resources feel inadequate. It makes us feel like we're vulnerable. And I know the people who've raised their hands can attest to the fact that this weight that they're carrying is slowing them down. It's slowing them down. It's killing the progress in their life. And so right now, Lord, I just pray that the supernatural peace of God will take over their understanding, that they will submit to the power of God, including me, Lord. I'm struggling with a few things as well. Help us, Lord, to remember, to rejoice in all the good things you've done, and the fact that you're coming back for us. Help us, Lord, to recall and recite those promises you've made to us. Never forgetting that in every situation in life, you care about us. The difficult ones perfect our faith, and the blessings that you bring into our life help us to be encouraged. And so today, Father, I pray that whatever it is that is weighing down my brothers and sisters right now, they will make a decision to turn it over to you. That they will make a decision to let you pull the busload of anxiety that they're carrying. And that the peace of God, this is 
Lord, my apostolic prayer over everyone today, that the peace of God will renew their heart and their mind in Christ Jesus. And they will walk out of this building today feeling lifted, feeling encouraged, feeling peace and not anxiety. Let peace prevail over our church today in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless.